Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon to everyone, depending on where, which part of the world you're in. So thank you so much for joining us for our live this month. And as some of you may know, our topic for this month is AI and life below water. And we have Johan Runhar here uh, from an organization called Reef Support, who's going to be speaking to you today about that. And uh, life below water also happens to be the 14th sustainable development goal of the United Nations. And that's SDG 14. And that's why we're going to be speak. That's the topic that we've picked for this month. And that's why we have Johan to tell us a little bit more about it. Um, so I think what we're going to do is Johan is going to present a little bit about his work and tell you a bit about himself and what he does. And then at the end, all of you can just raise your hand or put questions in the chat and ask him whatever you like. Uh, if you think you might forget your question by the end, just feel free to type it in the chat while he's presenting so that you don't forget what you have in mind by the end. But otherwise, I think we're good to go. So, Rohan, uh, Johan, over to you. Yes. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I hope you're all doing good. Uh, I'm Johan Renard. I'm based in the Netherlands uh, uh, to, and together uh, with Reef Support, for which I'm uh, the co-founder and also the CTO. Um, we try to help uh, preserve our oceans using innovation. Uh, so with a combination of uh, AI and also um, uh, new emerging satellite technologies, we try to provide new insights um, to uh, coral reef managers to help them conserve uh, um, their biodiversity, their uh, marine ecosystem, and help help preserve the oceans. Uh, so today I'm going to be presenting the importance of uh, coral reefs, uh, what exactly they are as well, um, a bit of uh, um, storytelling about coral reefs and um, why they're in danger. And uh, at the end, I'll be also presenting how we try to help them preserve them using AI. And so let's get started. I hope you're all excited. You should be able to see my screen now. Yes, we can see it. OK. Also, kids, if you want to ask you something that you need to respond to, you can unmute yourself and answer him or use the React button mm -hmm. in the Zoom. Yes, feel free to, to leave uh, questions in the chat, like mentioned, and um, we can answer them at the end. Or if it's something that I can just answer quickly during the presentation, I can do so as well. Um, so you can all see the, the nice slides now, right? Yes, we can. OK, all right. Well, let's get started. So like I mentioned, today we're going to be seeing the importance of coral reefs and how we can help preserving them using artificial intelligence. So uh, in the first step, we'll be looking at uh, what corals are, um, the different types of corals, and uh, what they eat as well. Uh, then we'll be looking at coral reefs and their importance, um, why they are in danger, um, the impact this has, and the potential solutions to saving coral reefs. And then uh, I'll be presenting exactly what we do at Reef Support uh, and how AI and space data can help um, I can help us preserve our oceans. And at the end, I'll, I'll present some little actions that you can take for yourself to help save our oceans and uh, some jobs that might be interesting for you in the future if you want to save our, help save our planet. Uh, so let's get started. Um, I'm sure uh, maybe you've always already seen coral reefs while, while diving with your parents or so, uh, scuba diving, for example, or even in aquariums. But um, I'm sure that you've all seen uh, this movie already, Nemo. Well, as you can see in this movie, um, with Nemo and his father, uh, heading to school, all these beautiful, colorful, uh, well, rock-like or uh, in, in in all different shapes and colors. These are these are well beautiful entities that we call coral reefs. And as you can see, it's it's home to a really uh, diverse uh, marine ecosystem. 
Um, so I, yeah, I'm sure that you've already seen this movie. It was just to uh, put yourself in um, fam in a familiar position again with uh, how coral reefs should look like um, when they're healthy and colorful. Um, but what exactly are coral reefs? Maybe someone can answer me uh, here, but um, do you know if corals are actually rocks, plants or animals? Corals are plants, right? Corals are plants, okay. Does anyone have another guess? Um, it can be, I mean, it, it can be uh, rocks and plants, it, the, either one of them. Either one, okay. Okay, well, I can I can see what you, what you might think that uh, based on the uh, shape. Oh, Rishi, you want to take your guess? Uh, yeah, corals are animals, right? Corals are animals. Okay, okay. Well, he spoiled the answer there, but uh, I can I can see why the uh, why the others uh, guessed uh, rocks and plants based on uh, on how how they actually look like. But in reality, um, corals are actually animals. Um, they're very very uh, they're a colony of very tiny creatures called polyps, as you can see here in the image, the very small, like, tentacly shaped uh, um, creatures. Those are actually animals called polyps, and together uh, they, they can either live individually or together in large colonies. And uh, these coral polyps, they protect themselves by building a skeleton around themselves, uh, which is why they might uh, sometimes look like rocks uh, if it's hard corals or plants if they are soft corals. So I'll be explaining the difference between the two later on. Um, but essentially, they are animals. So um, these skeletons, they can form over a million of years um, to then form giant coral reefs, uh, which are home to then an enormous numbers of other marine creatures as well. Um, so these corals, uh, there are more than 2,000 different types of corals that form these colonies, so they can take on um, a bunch of different shapes, have a lot of different colors, and we can distinguish between hard corals and soft corals. Um, and as the name implies, the main difference is that hard coral uh, polyps um, uh, are, are structured in a hard caution uh, skeleton. And while soft corals, on the other hand, are held together by a jelly-like uh, um, rigid structure, as you can see in the second image. Um, and that's what holds them together. So the main difference is, is the structure, um, like the name implies. Um, and I also want to add soft corals. Uh, you don't want to confuse them with sea animals, even though they look a lot like each other. Uh, sea animals on the right are a single animal. It's a single animal, while, uh, like I mentioned, corals is a colony of multiple very small uh, uh, polyps, which are all animals. So yeah, sea animals, they are uh, they look like them. Uh, they are fleshy as well. They can sting. So be careful uh, of them. Um, but so while coral comp comprise of colonies, um, this is a single animal. Um, but so how do corals grow, actually? Uh, corals must grow in shallow water uh, because they need direct sunlight to reach them. Without sunlight, they cannot grow because coral depend on the algae that is growing inside uh, inside them for oxygen, as you can see in the uh, bottom picture. Uh, so these uh, the green things here, those are all algae, and uh, algae need uh, sunlight to survive, like any other plant. Um, so algae, uh, so Corals are partly composed of plants, but the um, the tentacly thing itself is an animal. And what do they eat? Um, I'm sure that you all recognize this nice little character right here. Um, but so coral polyps are generally nocturnal. That means that uh, during the day they stay in their um, uh, in their skeleton. Uh, to stay safe, like any other animal would in the in uh, in the wild to protect themselves, um, because there is no light during the day uh, to feed uh, the uh, to feed themselves, because plankton are more abundant at night. So it doesn't make sense for them uh, for the polyps to come out during the day. And how they actually eat plankton uh, at night is that they stretch their tentacles to capture plankton in the water which is then deposited in the mouth of the 
uh, of the of the coral polyp. And um, let's now look at coral reefs. So, like I mentioned, um, corals uh, when the uh, coral polyps when they go together um, and um, have their skeleton grow around them to protect themselves, they can together form um, large colonies of of these coral skeletons that we name coral reefs. So coral reefs, although they cover only 1% of our marine, uh, of our ocean floor, which is a very, very low number, uh, they support more than a quarter of our marine biodiversity, which is huge in comparison to how much they cover. So it can have all different uh, well, shapes and colors and can be um, home to a lot of different uh, animals, like you can see here, uh, very different structures of very different colors. So yeah, it's it's very it's a very important and beautiful uh, ecosystem. Um, we can also find different types of coral reefs. Uh, so for example, the first one is uh, the fringing reef type. This is a fringing reef island uh, of the coast of uh, Yap in Micronesia. Uh, so fringing reefs uh, are bordering um, emerging lands. So small islands like this one, for example. There, uh, as you can see, these, the, these are the reefs around the islands. So they're very narrow and close to the coast. And sometimes they're just separated by a very small channel of water, like here. Um, and this is frequently, uh, it's, they can be frequently found in uh, archipelagos with um, small islands like, uh, like in Micronesia or in uh, the Caribbean in the Antilles. Uh, the second type is uh, probably the most known is are the barrier reefs. Uh, so these reefs are much, much wider than uh, the fringing reefs that we've just seen. Um, so they can look, uh, these are actually all uh, coral reefs. Um, so they're um, separated from the coast by a lagoon of uh, variable width shallow uh, and up to a hundred meters from the coast. And uh, they can best be found in uh, uh, in the islands in uh, uh, in the ocean uh, in uh, Oceania um, by the coast of Australia by the coast of the French Polynesian islands or uh, New Caledonia uh, and the final type is uh, the atoll um, so the atoll uh, is kind of like a fringing reef but uh, there's no island anymore in the middle. So um, how this happened is that a former volcano that has now become an immersed island, which means that the volcano has gone uh, underneath the water, um, has caused that the coral reef that constituted the remaining, uh, well, the fringe reef uh, is now encircling just a lagoon. Um, and sometimes this can have uh, open passes um, connecting the lagoon in the middle and the actual ocean water. When most of the cases, uh, they are closed uh, atolls. Uh, if there's an open pass, it's called an open atoll. Um, and yeah, they, they, they look awesome as well, from, especially when you look at them from space. Um, you can mainly found, find them in the French Polynesia Islands as well. Um, so yeah, just a quick, re a quick explanation of how uh, these different types of coral reefs are formed. So you have an active volcano, for example. Um, when the volcano um, yeah, is born, reefs are formed around. Uh, so the coral, coral colonies grow their skeletons and um, form what we call a coral reef. And that can be formed all around the island. Uh, when the volcano ages and starts to subsidize, um, we get a barrier reef in the first instance with a larger a gap between the island and uh, our coral reefs. And when the volcano is completely uh, submerged underwater, that's where we get the atoll formation. So why are these coral reefs uh, so much talked about in the last few years? And why is it so important that we save them? So coral reefs uh, are also known as uh, natural barriers for um, uh, cities that live, live by the coast, coastal communities, and are very important for people that def depend on fish and income by the coast. So as you can see here in this uh, nice little graph, uh, the first image has the presence of a lot of coral reefs um, 
by their coastline. And as you can see, there's a lot of more animals as well. But um, mainly what this image is trying to depict is uh, how they serve as a natural barrier because uh, coral reefs, they help protect coastlines from damaging effects of wave action and tropical storm. Uh, they can reduce the strength of a wave by more than 90%, which is huge. So as you can see, without the presence of coral reefs, um, by many of these coastlines, water would just submerge the land and um, destroy a lot of habitats uh, of the communities that live around these coasts. So it is very important for these coastal communities that we help preserve um, their natural barrier. Uh, in a second instance, um, yeah, as you might have seen, uh, uh, yeah, from this picture, you might have guessed it, but coral reefs provide a habitat and shelter for many uh, marine organisms. Uh, so as I mentioned, it covers less than 1% of our seabed, but is home to more than 25%, uh, approximately 30% of uh, the biodiversity in our oceans, um, which is a lot. So the fishing industry also depends on coral reefs. Um, because many fish spawn there and young fish spend time there before actually reaching the open ocean. Um, so yeah, like, a, like the previous statement, coral reefs is, uh, is the home of a lot of animals because it's also the source of essential nutrients for a, a, the marine food chain that uh, presides by the reefs. Uh, so as you can see, uh, reefs themselves they um, well, they eat plankton, but then um, they release themselves also nutrients, which are essential for uh, planktivorous fish and smaller fishes, uh, which are then uh, sourced to uh, even larger fishes like, just, such as sharks and other predators. So it is very important to preserve coral reefs for the entire uh, ecosystem that lives around them. And finally. Um, this is something that might not be known to uh, most people, uh, but reefs is also essential in, in helping us combat uh, global warming because uh, about one quarter of uh, the CO2 emitted is actually absorbed by the ocean. Um, one quarter by plants and trees and the remaining one quarter remains in the atmosphere. So coral reefs, they help contribute in this uh, carbon fixa fixation underwater. Um, because they actually uh, absorb the CO2 in their water to help um, build uh, their skeleton around their colonies. And um, so essentially they contribute in helping us uh, preserve um, our global temperature and reducing global the effects of global warming. Um, but why are these corals in danger? Uh, so as you can see here in, in this image, unfortunately, um, while well, these colorful images that we've been seeing thus far are not always uh, representative of uh, the current reality, because unfortunately we have already lost or severely damaged more than 50% of the world's coral reefs, which is enormous. Um, and studies, they project that uh, nearly all reefs will be threatened by 2050 if no action is taken now to reduce these threats. Um, so uh, yeah, as you can see from this image, I'll be talking a bit later about uh, about this effect, the coral bleaching effect. But um, essentially, reefs are dying, and um, they're losing their their energy, their life, and all the ecosystem around them. Um, so reason number one is uh, fresh in the ocean. Uh, 60 to 80 percent of the trash in the ocean is, plast uh, is plastic and what plastic does to, to corals, first of all, it uh, carries a lot of different, um, um, it, yeah, it carries a lot of different sickness um, and contact with plastic uh, has a 20 times, uh, corals that are contacted with plastic have, are 20 times more likely to become sick than those that do not. And uh, the biggest effect is that corals, uh, that plastic also um, prevents lights and light and oxygen from reaching the corals. So, um, for example, here, as you can see here in this image, um, the, the, the plastic itself it blocks the uh, sun sun uh, sun rays to reach uh, the polyps and the algae in the polyps that help them grow. Um, and as plastic also promotes the growth of dangerous pathogens. 
uh, which is why they are more likely to become sick. So it is very important to also keep our oceans clean. Uh, reason number two is uh, harmful fishing techniques. Um, so walking directly uh, uh, on corals to fish for octopus, for example, is a common practice in some regions, which can just very much damage um, the coral uh, skeletons and the polyps uh, in them. Uh, but another important effect is uh, overfishing as overfishing plays a crucial role in uh, the food chain of coral reefs and it promotes the proliferation of invasive algae because the algae in the corals are um, in the coral regions are also eaten by um, uh, planktivorous fishes and with overfishing there's less fish which uh, yields a higher uh, growth rate of these uh, harmful algae which are very much da uh, damageful for the corals. And uh, finally, another technique is uh, like this image just picks. Um, and you might be already known some of you, but uh, some in some regions, um, they use uh, dynamite to fish, which um, well, they throw the dynamite in the water and then it goes the fish around the dynamite. The fish come to the surface and they fish them out. Uh, but this technique is very uh, damageful to the reef structure itself. And finally, the biggest reason is global warming, actually. So even though corals help reduce global warming, uh, global warming is what uh, is killing them the most. So an increase in surface water temperature of only one degree for two weeks is enough to cause the death of a, of a coral in a region, which is reflected by the phenomenon of uh, coral bleaching. Um, so the yeah the main reasons uh, as you already know is our deforestation, um, um, which are not only a cause for global warming actually, but uh, they are also uh, causing an increased transport of sediments in rivers that eventually reach um, the sea and the oceans, and this causes an increased uh, turbidity in the water, which means that there's less clarity in the water. And so uh, there's a less uh, chance of the sunlight uh, hitting the corals um, as they need, and thus directly affecting uh, the photosynthesis effect of the algae in the water, uh, which means, um, for those that don't know the term, it's how uh, plants need sunlight to grow. So uh, as, uh, because of um, the increase in sediments in the water, uh, there's less clarity and thus uh, the algae, the algae in the, um, the corals have a more difficult time growing. Um, so the impact on these reefs is the effect that is called coral bleaching. Um, so the image on the left is a healthy coral. The image in the middle is a sick coral, and the image on the right is a coral once it's dead. Um, so as you can see, the coral bleaching effect has three stages. Um, once it's sick, uh, we call it coral bleaching because the corals become uh, this white entity uh, as if it's completely bleached. Uh, this happens um, when corals are sick uh, because the uh, polyp skeletons um, lose their energy and release this white uh, ferroform effect, um, which is why they become all, all white. Uh, when they're at this stage, it is still possible to reverse the effect of coral bleaching. But like I mentioned, it only takes two weeks from cor for corals to become um, from the bleach to, to the dead state. So it is a very difficult process to actually reverse um, a coral bleaching event. Um, but it is possible by taking uh, hard measures, uh, ensuring that the water is uh, clean uh, that uh, there's no uh, fishing in the area, that nothing affects the health of the corals for a period so that they can uh, become healthy, can get out of their sickness. Um, so let's go, uh, let's go see now what the solutions are uh, to stop uh, all these different problems and help uh, coral grow again back to their um, original uh, and very um, proliferating um, environment. Um, so we are Reef Support. Uh, we are a team of uh, excited uh, uh, 
students and uh, engineers. Um, so our goal is to use innovation to help um, marine um, biologists, like you can see the two on the right. Um, the top one is uh, uh, Martijn and the bottom one is Christo. There are two marine biodiverse, uh, biologists who are helping uh, re-support as uh, advisors as well. Um, but uh, what we are doing is uh, creating software solutions for marine, marine biologists like Martijn and Christo uh, using uh, AI technologies, but also emerging satellite technologies to help these marine biologists turn their data into better decision making and help them with their everyday tasks. Uh, so essentially, um, like I, I said, uh, these alarming protections for coral reef health are increasingly becoming a major challenge in many parts of the world. But fortunately, we have these marine biologists, um, like on the picture here, that are uh, helping out uh, in preserving our oceans. And so, in with using satellite technologies and um, other uh, software applications uh, such as uh, artificial intelligence as well, we we help uh, these marine biologists uh, preserve our oceans. So let's let's go talk about AI for a sec. So AI, um, from what I understood, most of you have already um, gotten familiar with the concept based on other presentations, but some of you might not already know what uh, artificial intelligence is. Um, so artificial intelligence is the ability for a computer program um, or a machine to think and learn by himself. So the general term AI, uh, which stands for A for artificial and I for intelligence, it refers to a machine that mimics human cognition, so um, our, our intelligence, uh, or at least some of it, uh, such as learning and problem solving. But now let's see how we apply AI in our case to help our oceans. Um, so our main um, focus is to help with the um, um, the with it, it help, we, the, our main focus is to help with the identification of corals and measuring corals underwater, um, which is all done manually currently by uh, these coral reef managers. So. Here, we, for example, we have an untrained uh, AI model. Uh, we give um, our AI model uh, C4 pictures together with uh, labeling information of the, where corals are present in those pictures. Um, our AI model learns from this data by himself and is then able to, to give us answers by himself as well because he has learned from this data. So once when we then give just uh, the data, uh, of our C4 picture, the model is able to find the answer by himself and give us the correct response by himself as well, which is then the information that is uh, correlated to the picture. So originally when you train the model, you give it a picture and uh, a training information. Uh, so here in our case, it's um, lab labeled information of what is, um, what is in the picture itself. And uh, once it's trained, it's able to get, generate that information just based on the picture that it receives. Um, so why we do this is, like I mentioned, to help uh, coral reef managers and marine biologists in um, annotating their data. So this is just a very rough um, uh, exp UI explanation of uh, how this looks. So for example, um, coral reef managers, they, they spend a lot of time underwater uh, to measure um, uh, their marine region um, around their uh, marine protected area. Um, so it, usually they measure all the corals entities uh, manually. Uh, they take pictures and then process them all uh, when they go back uh, to the land in their lab. They look at every single picture and, and try to see what is uh, in them. But using artificial intelligence, we can completely automate this process for them. So we could give, uh, just based on the picture, uh, we could give them the response of how we think, what we think is present in the picture. So for example, this is the case of object detection, uh, where we detect different coral entities and label them uh, with their specific um, uh, family name. Um, but our main line of focus is, um, is object segmentation, which is a bit different than object detection. So in detection, you just try to detect 
uh, an object and you place a, a square around it, which is called a bounding box. Um, and that is not as precise as image segmentation because segmentation, you really um, try to go around the edges of, of the coral entities, uh, like is generated here in the second image. Um, so this color, for example, is uh, heart corals. Uh, this color is uh, algae entities. And then this is the rest because that is less important to us. Uh, our main importance is the presence of algae and um, corals, which is what uh, information we want to give to uh, the marine biologists to help them uh, accelerate their process of um, visualizing their underwater images. Uh, so the task of image segmentation is really uh, placing a very precise um, edges around the object and labeling uh, this object as uh, what it is. Um, further, uh, we are also working on um, uh, identifying other entities underwater. Uh, so for example, uh, the presence of um, harmful uh, stormfishes, starfishes. So uh, yeah, starfishes, you all know what they usually look like. Um, you can probably imagine Patrick the star from, from SpongeBob as well. Um, they're usually not harmful for coral reefs, but a lot of different species are. And um, because of the different changes in uh, marine environment, um, there is also an increase uh, but, um, well, growth of these uh, starfishes. But these starfishes, they feed themselves on coral reefs. So it's very harmful to have uh, a lot of them in, um, in your coral reef colony uh, because uh, they will just eat them all. So it's also important that we uh, produce this uh, identification AI for the coral reef managers and marine biologists to help them uh, measure their presence in the coral reef colonies. So essentially, uh, just to give an explanation as to why we're doing this, um, what I mentioned that they do everything manually, as you can see here on the top left, they take pictures of their corals with underwater cameras, or uh, they take they do everything uh, numerically. Um, when they go back to their lab, this can take five to seven days themselves to go through every single picture and annotate everything and, and, and make the measurements that are necessary, which, which is a huge time loss for them, which they can spend on more uh, effective thing. So using um, our AI, we aim to reduce this to just a matter of hours, because with AI, we can just automate uh, that whole process and do things very rapidly. Um, further, uh, next to AI, we also use uh, satellite technologies. I'm just going to talk very briefly about this as that's one of the focus of the presentation, but essentially, uh, we use the satellites of the European Space Agency. Um, that take a lot of different pictures of our little planet. And so with, um, well, they don't just take pictures, they also measure a lot of different uh, parameters. Um, but so with our uh, computers, we analyze uh, the data that is collected by these satellites and transform them into essential information for scientists specialized in coral reef conservation. So uh, the, this information can be, for example, the sea surface temperature or the acidity in the water which are very important parameters for the health of coral reefs. So we also provide this to marine scientists so that they have more information that to, to actually make better decisions about how to save the corals in their area. Um, so let's now talk uh, about little actions that you can take as well to save our planets and uh, conclude this uh, presentation because uh, I'm sure that you all have plenty of questions to ask. Um, so as a first action, you could avoid uh, buying and using items such as disposable plastic water bottles, uh, cautories, and straws, as we have seen that um, plastic uh, very often well, lands in our ocean, and this is very harmful um, and one of the main reasons um, for the re if, if, uh, one of the main reasons that corals uh, become sick and uh, start bleaching. Um, as a second action, when you go uh, scuba diving or diving or just swimming in the ocean um, and you see very nice coral reef structures, try to avoid touching them with your hands or 
or standing on them, just touch only with your eyes uh, because they're very fragile and it's very easy to break a coral structure and it's best to avoid doing so. Um, you can also reduce your uh, carbon footprint. Um, as we have seen that global warming is one of the main effects for uh, coral bleaching. Um, so this can be done by using the bike, for example, or using public transport more often than uh, your own car. Uh, you can also motivate your parents in doing this. <laughs> um, and uh, another action could be going out uh, and helping actually in different cleaning events uh, to help reduce um, the uh, amount of plastic that goes into our oceans and other trash as well. Um, for those who have pets at home, um, try to be careful and responsible. Uh, some of the food uh, and also, um, uh, well, uh, toys and so that you provide to uh, your pets often do land in the, uh, in the trash and um, some of them um, then land in the ocean and you, you can check on, on the objects if, on the food and so if, if they're made with biodegradable materials as well because some of them have nutrients that are very toxic to uh, our ocean. But most importantly, plastic bags that you use to pick up your uh, pet's uh, um, well, uh, poop. Um, you should be careful as to how you throw them, try to always recycle them uh, as well, um, as they also usually land in the ocean. Um, and finally, you could also support some organizations that help conserve our oceans. Um, for example, uh, the WWF organization and so on, but a lot of different coral uh, NGOs uh, have programs where you can adopt a coral for yourself. So for those who don't have a pet at home, you could also uh, adopt a coral as a pet if you want. <laughs> but essentially, this you're helping uh, donating a bit of money to these uh, NGOs that then um, grow a coral under your name in their uh, coral region, which is very nice. Uh, and finally, a couple of jobs that can help save our planet. So um, if you're looking to, in the future, help innovate and uh, solve some of these problems that can help not only save our oceans, but also our planet as a whole, uh, this can be from scientists to biologists where you're actually researching um, the effects of, of global warming or uh, researching um, ways of, of helping solve uh, coral bleaching and so on. Uh, you, can, you could become a computer scientist uh, such as me um, to help develop applications uh, using AI to make our world a better and cleaner place as well. Um, you could become a politician as uh, the biggest effects are, taking, uh, are taken at a large scale and uh, politicians have a lot of say as to uh, how, we, how we do our everyday business and so on um, and essentially how we, feel, how we treat our, our, our planet. Um, you could also become a diver marine expert uh, and actually work directly with corals uh, yourself, which is very, very cool. Or you could also become an engineer and create other potential solutions that can help make our world a better and greener place. Um, so that was it for this presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, we went a bit longer than I expected, um, but we have we still have quite some minutes for you to ask questions, so feel free to ask them now. Thank you so much, Johan. That was absolutely lovely. And I think our kids would have learned so, so much. Uh, so yes, like Johan said, kids, feel free to raise your hand and we can take questions. Uh, I know we do have Rishi over here and Johan, just so you know, Rishi is a scuba diver and if I'm oh. not wrong, aspiring uh, marine expert. So I think he does have a question for you. So Rishi, you also can feel free to unmute yourself and ask and I can see some others have their hand raised too. So we'll just go one by one. All right. Where can we adopt a coral? Um. Well, there's multiple organizations where you can do so. Um, I could I could provide uh, a couple of names um, uh, that that can then be shared uh, with you afterwards. Um, but um, large organizations such as 
uh, well, reef check. Um, and we are working with one very closely in Indonesia, which is called the Indonesia Biru Foundation, uh, which is a smaller NGO. But uh, all these all these different organizations they essentially do the same thing, where they uh, accept donations from the public, which is uh, very helpful for them, uh, because using these donations they um, then are able to grow more corals in their uh, in their uh, region. Um, and usually they start doing so on land first and coral laboratories uh, to go because because that helps um, corals grow faster in in very specific regions. And once they're big enough, they place them in the water in the colony, and this helps the colony grow at a faster rate. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the awesome question. Hi, uh, so basically, um, I remember you were telling about, uh, you know, the what, what the corals exactly eat. So like, you know, what mm -hmm. do they have for like food? So can you just repeat that? Yes, of course. Um, I don't know if you remember the nice little uh, picture that I had next to it. Uh, let's see. Yeah, plankton. So um, are you familiar with pl what planktons are? Um, no, I'm not actually. Okay. Uh, well, planktons are very, very tiny little sea creatures. Um, they don't like the sunlight. So uh, during the day, uh, you, they are usually very deep in the water. Um, they're also one of the favorite uh, um, uh, foods, uh, nutrients for, uh, um, um, for whales. So that's why whales as well um, at night they're also uh, uh, during the day they're also they also go very deep in the water uh, because then they can eat uh, as many planktons as they wish. But at night the planktons go at a higher level, which is where we also find corals because corals they're fixed fixated so they cannot move. Unfortunately, otherwise they would uh, just go uh, down during the day to go eat the, the planktons there as well. But so they're fixed up there uh, and the planktons reach them at night. And the corals could just grab them with their little tentacles, and uh, that's how they eat. So, uh, are they, so they're like microscopic, right? right? So you cannot see them. With they're the very, eyes. very small. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. These are microscopic uh, pictures as well. Okay. All right. Thank you. Hi. Yes. Yeah. You said you Hi. use satellite. So I was wondering, do you use GIS or other methods to like locate where dead or Deep, like dying corals are. Oh wow! I was I was not expecting um, <laughs> such an advanced question, but yes, we do uh, use GIS technologies. That is a term uh, referred to when um, you're using uh, measurements used uh, taken from from space or by drones or so. Um, uh, so essentially, a bit of more information as to what we're doing here. Um, we're using uh, parameters that are collected by satellites, uh, such as, like I mentioned, sea surface temperature, acidity. Uh, we're also looking at other parameters, uh, such as water currents, um, the pH level in the water, and so uh, the salin salinity as well. Um, uh, but essentially, using these parameters, you get uh, a lot of data over time uh, of specific regions in the water. Uh, and we try to map that data um, in correlation with other um, um, information that is collected uh, by the uh, marine biologists themselves. Um, but using this data, we can also offer um, predictions using not only um, AI, well, it is technically a bit like AI, but it's more, uh, it's, um, um, it's called time series forecasting, um, which is another uh, technique to uh, predict uh, new data points. So using the past information that we have collected by satellites, we can also predict um, how a region is evolving. So how the sea surface temperature is going to be in a couple months, which is very insightful for uh, coral reef managers. And this process is called GIS, yes. I also had another question. So how could like young divers like myself and like others help? Um, well, there's a couple of things that you can do. Uh, first of all, uh, you could uh, help uh, bring more enthusiasm towards the ocean by uh, telling uh, yeah, your family, your friends, uh, how awesome it is to dive and how important it is to sa save these um, reefs. But uh, uh, essentially, uh, some actions that you can take for yourself. 
Um, I know there are some a couple applications that already do this. Uh, we're trying to, to create a community of our own regarding this, but it, uh, data is essential um, for saving this problem using uh, software. So to, to build our AI models, data is very important. Um, and so what you could do is help with collecting uh, essential pictures of, uh, of coral reefs that can be very helpful in training um, our AI models, but also other models from uh, universities or researchers that are trying to solve um, uh, a, a couple of these problems that marine biologists are face, facing um, to help, help so, save our oceans. So it can be very useful, uh, the pictures that you have collected this far, um, to help train and solve uh, this problem. And uh, lastly, like, what advice would you give like students who are pursuing like a similar line of education? Um, oh yeah, that's a, that's also a very interesting question. Um, I would say um, my biggest advice is to always uh, always stay up to date and always try to uh, because the space is evolving at such a rapid rate, like we've never seen before, and it's, it keeps increasing and increasing. Uh, so my biggest advice is to always. Uh, uh, stay excited and enthusiastic because this is also why it's always also so awesome to be in this space. Um, so always try to read up and and keep up to date with uh, the new technologies and new advancements out there, uh, new research that is being done. Um, because that is uh, how you're gonna be uh, succeeding as well if you're always uh, aware of the latest uh, and emerging new technologies. Thank you. That is some great advice, Johan. Uh, would anyone else like to ask a question? I can see Shivam, Sohan, Vyomini, Meher, Fioni. Don't be shy. <laughs> okay, in the meantime, if you want a second to think, I'm good. I'm going to ask uh, Johan a question. So can I ask Johan yeah. what, what inspired you to kind of set this up and how did you come about the idea so that even our kids can know, you know, how they can sort of connect their hobbies into real life work? Mm -hmm. Yes, well, uh, when we started uh, ReSupport about a year and a half ago, um, my main motivation was to uh, use all the knowledge that I built up in my studies uh, and outside of my studies as well to really ap apply it to um, something that is, that is great for our planet. Um, and so during the, that these years at Reef Support, we've noticed that there's uh, quite some lack in um, um, in these programs that try to educate uh, uh, the younger folks uh, as to why this is also an important uh, um, aspect and problem that needs to be taken care of. Um, because even though it's a lot, it had, it's a lot in the news lately uh, with the large bleaching events in the Great Barrier Reef, for example, in Australia. Um, it's not talked about enough in our opinion, and it's not the impact is not um, uh, known enough, uh, not only with kids, but also uh, uh, just in general, uh, people believe that uh, it's said that we're losing coral reefs, but it, that it's only affecting the marine biodiversity uh, around it, but not, they don't know about all the other effects that it might have on coastal communities and even on our um, global uh, temperature as well. So uh, we find it very important to, to educate uh, younger folks on this problem as well. And this, this is why we actually uh, got started with the uh, Reef Students and Reef for Kids program. Awesome, thank you. So, so kids, you can also, anything that inspires you, you can experiment with your independent projects that you do in class. So they actually build like real time mini AI models in class. So I was just telling them, you know, you can, any ideas that you have, use class time to kind of think about that, ask your teachers. And I'm sure you can be doing cool stuff like Johan is doing when you grow up. Exactly. Always, always try to uh, innovate, guys. Absolutely. Uh, okay, so I cannot see any more hands raised. So I think we'll stop here and we're almost out of time anyway. So thank you so much, Johan. And it was really a pleasure listening to you. And I'm going to ask Rishi to say thank you to you from all the kids as well. 
Yeah, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to help us understand how AI is helping preserve and protect our marine ecosystem and environment. And thank you so much to Coding and more as well for hosting this wonderful seminar. Thank you so much. Yes, well, thank you guys for all uh, joining as well today. Um, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed giving these presentations. Uh, I hope you learn a lot. I hope you have a lot to say to your family and friends as well as to how we can uh, help save our oceans. And uh, I wish you all good luck um, for in your future. And I hope uh, I hope you're all going to innovate as much uh, to save our planet. Awesome. Okay, so there's some thank you messages for you in the chat as well, I think. Thank you, kids. Okay, so we're going to stop here. Uh, thank you for coming, everyone. Bye. Hi. Hi. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye.